Party Mode. Good afternoon and welcome to another webinar presentation uh, hosted by the Southwest Ontario Regional Base Hospital Program. My name is John Duran. I am your interim education coordinator. And today's topic, uh, we'll be discussing tracheostomy and stoma care. Uh, the presenters for this webinar, um, as always with us, is Dr. Matt Davis, who is the who is the um, medical director of education and also the local medical uh, director for the London area. Uh, we have two pre-hospital care specialists with us today, uh, Pete Morosuti, who is a uh, pre-hospital care specialist for the Windsor area, and Dwayne Cottell, who is the pre-hospital care specialist for the London area. And also with us today is uh, Myron Steinman, who is an RT out of our London office here. Uh, so a couple of things before we get started. If you would like to ask a question at any point uh, about this webinar, uh, you can do that in uh, two ways. So if you look at your control panel, you will see a hand icon. So if you press the hand icon, I know you have your hand up, and I will be asking you at the end of the presentation to ask your question if you have voice capability. Another way you can ask a question is uh, as simple as there's a section where you can actually type out a question and send it to me. Uh, your questions, um, especially if it's IT related, if you send it by typing it out, that probably works the best. And then we can try to uh, troubleshoot it for you uh, here that way. And I think that's all I had. Uh, so, gentlemen, the uh, floor is yours. Can everybody hear us now? I hope. Sorry, a little technical difficulty. Oh, start again? All right, well, thanks. Um, hi, all. Uh, this is Pete. Uh, we're going to start with a little poll question here. Uh, we might have a little difficulty with the slideshow, so bear with us. We're going to start with a poll question. How many trachs or stomas have you suctioned in your career? Uh, 0 to 2 for A, 2 to 5 for B, C 5 to 10, D greater than 10. Please remember there is no correct answers on this. We just want a generalized overview of what may have happened in the past. So go ahead and answer, please. And John will hopefully give us the results. 70% 0 to 2. Ah, perfect. So 70% of you, thank you very much, have responded 0 to 2 trachs in your career. All right, so what do we expect out of today? So at the end of this training session, paramedic, that's you, should be able to explain the reasons why a patient would have a trach or a stoma, describe the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system, as well as the anatomical and physiological differences of a patient with a trach or stoma. Differentiate and recognize common types of trach tubes and stomas. Be able to state the appropriate ventilation parameters as it applies to the trach and stoma. And understand and describe how to administer medications to a patient with a trach and stoma as it applies through the ACP PCP scope of practice. As well as for everyone, uh, just so you know, we're in the process of developing a tracheal 
endotracheal and trache tracheostomy suctioning medical directive. So Dr. Matt Davis is going to touch on that for us. So it has been identified that there's a, a bit of a gap here when we have patients that require suctioning who have a tracheostomy. And the, uh, the Provincial Medical Advisory Committee has recognized this and has developed a, a directive for both ACPs and PCPs. Uh, currently, we have endorsed the directive and is sitting with the Ministry of Health. So currently, there is not a directive, but shortly, very shortly, hopefully, that uh, the Ministry of Health will release that, that directive with the upcoming uh, a new version of the ALS PCS, uh, the one that will have some changes in it based on the 2015 guidelines. So uh, it's, in, it's in works, it's coming down the road. When it will be in play, I'm not sure at this time, but uh, you know, stay tuned for that. Great, so <clears throat> just gonna take a look here uh, for reasons for a tracheostomy or stoma. So you can essentially break all these down into three categories. Um, the first one is a cancer of the larynx, uh, a gunshot wound to the neck, some severe laryngeal fractures, uh, laryngeal stenosis, and other forms of trauma. Uh, when you break them into three groups, uh, they go into essentially a, a, a group of obstruction, prolonged ventilation, and ventilation with an airway that no longer has any issues. So obstruction of the upper airway, so some examples of that would be like uh, cancerous tumors uh, and various forms of trauma. Uh, prolonged ventilation category, so this is when you start getting into these long-term vents, uh, patients who are in the ICU. Uh, a lot of the times uh, they're, they're prolonged because they have a failure to wean off the, the ventilator. Um, and there's different medical conditions that can get into that. One of the common ones is ALS, so uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And then the third category is ventilation and airway uh, with no longer having any issues. Um, so an endotracheal tube or a, a stoma is still needed uh, for tracheal suction and that, that would fall into that category. So if you want, if we look at the top picture, the top in the center, um, that displays a, a laryngeal fracture you can see by the arrow there. Um, and then when you start looking at the other pictures, the bottom left and right, there's air tracking, you can see with the arrows, there's air tracking around the neck and into the trach. Um, uh, this does pose a problem for us in the field because it's diff when we get when we start getting air in spaces that's not supposed to be there. It's hard to secure uh, an airway with BLS and even ALS means. And the, when the ventilations become compromised, uh, this results uh, in tissue and brain hypoxia, seizures, coma, and then possibly um, ultimately up into cardiac arrests. So we're just going to do a quick overview of the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system. Okay, so essentially, um, with this, there's uh, a few different sections. So the upper airway, consisting of the nasal cavity, and that's including the sinuses. Uh, we're looking at the uh, nasopharynx, uh, the oropharynx, the hypopharynx, and then essentially down to the larynx. So you also have, a, uh, in the nasal cavity, four pairs of sinuses. And from superior to inferior, there's the frontal sinuses, the ethmoid, the sphenoidal, and then the maxillary sinuses. Other parts of the, other, uh, the upper airway are the nasal pharynx, the oropharynx, and the hypopharynx, as well as the larynx. And uh, just a quick note that um, a trach tube or a stoma enters in the lower portion of the airway, so you're getting deeper into the airway as opposed to the upper airway. Continuing on with anatomy and physiology of the respiratory system, as we know, uh, air enters the nasal cavity through the nares. Uh, it's warm humidify and humidified by uh, blood-rich membranes in there, and then the air is filtered by a uh, series of coarse hairs of cilia. Uh, just a couple things to discuss here as a directive to relate with the tracheostoma. The first point is uh, this becomes important due to the fact that when a patient has a tracheostoma, the process of cleaning the air has essentially been bypassed. As a result of this, that air is not cleaned, it's not filtered through the, uh, the, the coarse hairs in the uh, upper airway, and then what happens is you always run the risk of an increased infection. 
Uh, the second point is by bypassing the natural warming and humidification of the air going into, the, into your airways, it increases the risk of mucus plugging. Um, and that ends up uh, resulting in increased aggressive suctioning needed for this patient to maintain, as well as hypoxic issues. Moving forward here, there's a couple uh, interesting photos here. So when we start just looking at the anatomy, uh, the picture on the left illustrates the nasal conche and the turbinates. Um, and with the arrow, you can look where the, if you just, you can look here, the airflow starts to move through and around and then down into the oral cavity. Uh, and this is where the humidification and the cleaning of the air really starts to take place in the filtering. Uh, the picture on the right, this does show a sagittal view of the major structures and the drainage, drainage paths of the sinuses. No one expects you to remember this. It's what it is, it's just, it shows where the drainage takes place into the nasal pharynx. Now a large amount of the sinus drainage uh, increases the risk of aspiration into the lower airway, which can cause huge problems for us trying to maintain the airway. It is important to point out, since trach patients tend to aspirate more than the general population, and when you take that into consideration, there is an increased mucus production, and in turn, sometimes we have a more difficult time uh, managing the airway. So just kind of continuing on here, the hypopharynx, uh, where is it located? It's at the tip of the epiglottis, and this extends down to the glottic opening of the esophagus. Uh, the hypopharynx is lined with uh, mucosal membranes, and this helps uh, in humidifying the air that enters at this location, and then as well as it prevents and protects its surfaces uh, from abrasions, therefore reducing the risk of infection, bleeding, and hypoxia as a result. So the larynx itself, we're going to get into the nitty gritty here, essentially serves three functions. It is the air passage between the pharynx and the lungs. Uh, it prevents aspiration into the respiratory tree, and it aids in the production of speech. Um, with that, it's important to note, if the patient is able to speak, then there is air movement in the upper airway. So if they're able to speak, there is lots of air movement into the upper airway, and you'll know at least you have some form of, some form of airway patency. When we get into the uh, larynx, there are uh, lots of cartilages there. Six are paired, three of them are unpaired. They're all interconnected by muscles and ligaments. And kind of from superior to inferior, you have the thyroid cartilages, uh, the arytenoid cartilages, and then the cricoid cartilage itself. So when we think about the uh, structure of, of our Adam's apple, essentially uh, the lamest term for the larynx, uh, the anatomical landmarks are very important uh, for us to know. It's not really necessary for procedure, but for reference and location. There's very few things outside of uh, services that are utilizing uh, cricothyrotomies and, uh, and that sort of thing at the ACP level. So, but it's good to note that um, uh, the trach is always below the cricoid cartilage, and Remembering um, there's uh, two services that fall in this works area at the advanced care pyramidic level that are utilizing needle cricothyrotomies or the, uh, the cell air kits. And when that needle is placed in, it needs to go in that cricothyroid membrane, okay, which is located between the thyroid and the cricoid cartilages respectively. So with this, I just want to show you, uh, there's a couple photos here. Um, the picture on the left is essentially what that will look like when somebody has been uh, needle criked. Okay, and obviously that's a mannequin on the left hand side. Uh, it should be in the cricothyroid membrane. It's kind of like a, like a, like a, a smiley face below the, uh, the cricoid cartilage. And then the picture on the right is what a trach or a stoma will look like once it has been inserted, and you can see that is superior to the substernal notch. Um, it is it is a larger hole. Okay, this can be done surgically, um, or uh, it can be permanent as well. And sometimes it is a temporary uh, procedure just for maintaining uh, airway patency. Good afternoon, guys. This is Myron Simon. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, types of trach tubes. I think I missed a slide here somewhere, but uh, 
We'll talk on types of, of trach tubes. If we look at the pictures, the pictures are really kind of cool. The, the one on the left is a picture of a patient with some sort of stoma that they have. Um, really hard to tell what kind of trach they have or what kind of stoma. All that we know really right now by looking at them is they have a hole in their neck. And so we know that something has is, is really kind of happened to them. If they had a surgical airway um, in the operating room, whatever hospital you're working with, the picture on the right kind of is a is a good demonstration or a good uh, cartoon of one of the methods that the surgeons will use to open the trach up. So they will create a bit of a door and they will flap it down or flap it up or create it like barn doors. It doesn't really matter, but they will open it up so that they, it gives them an option to open up in the operating room and then slide whatever sort of trach tube they're going to get inside of it. Uh, let me see. So really, if we if we think about a, a trach or a stoma, it's really um, anything that's permanent or temporary opening within the neck into the trachea itself. Um, if we look at the tubes itself, um, the, the tubes can be made of either plastic, silicone, or metal. And boy, I wish I could tell you you're always going to see a plastic one or a silicone one. Uh, but it really varies based on physician preference and service preference of what you're going to get. Um, you will get a wide variety of, of trach tubes and a wide variety of, of things you will get with your trach tube itself. Uh, but we're trying to we're going to try to give you something that's going to be um, as generic as possible. So every time you you find a trach, you'll be able, able to identify the very basics with it. So uh, one basic thing is they can either be cuffed or uncuffed. The reason we have a cuffed trach tube is largely so we can ventilate them, um, give them rest by bag valve mask or ventilator if they're at home. Uh, the second reason they're sometimes trached is if their swallowing is so awful, they need a trach, they need a cuff just to prevent gross aspiration. Most patients that you will see out of hospital, my expectation would be, would be uncuffed. Um, but it doesn't mean you're gonna, you're not gonna find somebody who has a cuffed tube in it. The attachment, what protrudes from the from the skin or from the neck, can either be flushed, or can have a standard connector that would attach to your BBM, um, which will be important to you when you respond to events and you find a patient with a trach there. Some to some trach tubes will allow you to attach a bag, other tubes will not. So, that's can we hit the next slide, please? Yeah. So this is a good picture of the of uh, the parts of the trach tube right now. Um, so if we look at the picture to the left of your screen, um, there's an operator there on that. It, it doesn't show a great picture of the operator. What the operator does, it's largely like a stylet for insertion of an ET tube. Um, that's there for reinsertion of the tube. Those are sized specifically for that tube, and people who have trachs will generally have that operator nearby them at all times. Um, those who go home with trachs, are usually pretty good either at putting them in themselves or have uh, family members accept that will put them in for them. But they will need that operator to put it put it in most of the time. Um, the fresher they are, the more challenging it is. So the operator gives it some stiffness and will allow it to slide in easier. Many trachs, but not all, will have an inner cannula. Uh, this inner cannula can be either reused and cleaned by the patient at home, um, or it will be something that they can take out, dispose of, and then throw another one in. Um, it will usually be cleaned or disposed of one or two times a day. And again, we talked about the cuff, the cuffs at the bottom really used to allow for positive pressure ventilation and prevent gross aspiration in the farther down the lower area. So when we start looking at the um, basic life support uh, patient care standards under the general standard of care, and we're thinking, like, okay, we have this patient um, with a trach and or stoma that needs suctioning. So what exactly do we do? So when we look at the BLS standards, it, it, it directly talks about suctioning. We get into our uh, primary exam, our physical assessment. Um, and if you look at section one, uh, one page, section one, page five F, what it says in there is that upon identification of absent or inadequate airway breathing or circulatory status, ABCs immediately perform the interventions uh, to establish and or improve the ABCs. Like we said, or Matt alluded to before, that there is a 
Um, there is a bit of a disconnect because we're expected to maintain these airways, but there's no actual directive kind of written at this point. Um, so we try to maintain with what we have and move forward and continue on essentially as we have been. I got a question, if that's okay, before we move on to the poll question. Uh, Dr. Davis, if you could answer. Now, would anybody, <laughs> would anyone uh, would I say they, they needed to perform this suctioning of the trach, would they get in trouble, per se, for providing this emergency care at this time? I know it's a multitude of questions that's probably going to pop up, so I might as well kill it right now. So definitely, uh, as I alluded to earlier, it's a bit of a, a disconnect or a gray area given that that procedure is considered a medical delegated act, uh, hence why uh, it's sitting at, the, at the, the ministry right now waiting for approval so that we can have a directive so that you can uh, perform this medical delegated act. You know the way the way things are right now. You know the, the word would be con continue doing it the way you've done it every day up until this directive comes out. So what you've been taught in the past is what you continue to do up until this this directive does does come out. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to have our second poll question, and um, when that's uh, up, you can go ahead and vote on that. So the question is. Uh, in regards to suctioning, what is the maximum continuous suctioning time per attempt according to the BLS patient care standards manual? So is it A, 30 seconds, uh, B, 10 seconds, C, 1 minute, or D, 2 minutes? So you can go ahead and um, cast your votes there. And, and I'll let you guys know as seconds. soon as it comes back. I've already launched the, um, uh, the poll question actually a little bit back. So. Um, it looks like 85% of the people identify. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll close up that uh, poll there now. I think everybody's had enough time to make their selections. Okay, so 80 or 14% said A, 30 seconds. 86% said B, 10 seconds. Uh, and C and D, no one had actually voted on that. So the correct answer is B. Uh, remembering from... Uh, our, our training in uh, paramedic school or ambulance emergency care school, we suction for a maximum of 10 seconds at a time, sweeping motion while we are withdrawing the catheter. So B, 10 seconds at a time is the correct answer. And taking into account that, remember, suctioning not only removes the secretions, it also pulls out the uh, oxygen-rich air that's in the airway at the same time. So we're going to go ahead and move forward here and just talking about ventilating a patient with a with a trach uh, or a stoma and this is kind of geared uh, to both PCPs and ACPs. Again, we always perform our primary exam, our airway breathing circulation. Uh, from that point, the need to ventilate the patient. So we pre-oxygenate these people, these patients by direct connection of the BVM to the opening of the trach. Um, as Myron had spoke about, uh, a lot of the times the adapters uh, will just hook right up to our BVM. They're kind of a universal fitting, a 15 millimeter inside, 22 millimeter outside diameter. If that is not available, uh, you can utilize the Seal Easy mask or like a pediatric recess size mask directly over top of the trach uh, or stoma opening and then ventilate, um, ventilate the patient as necessary. And these are all direct references from the current BLS Patient Care Standards Manual. Uh, you can look in there. Those are in sections one, section one, page five to section one, page eight. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Dwayne, I got a little tip or trick that might help as well. If you sit the patient up, not directly sitting them up, but about 30 degrees, just like we put them in the ROSC position yeah. and making it easier for you to ventilate these patients as well. It takes the undue stress off of them as well so yeah absolutely. you know throw them up at about 30 degrees yeah yeah that's yeah that's perfect that's perfect so that's good thanks Pete so we're gonna go to another poll question here this is gonna be our third poll question uh, we'll just wait to uh, get that set up here but essentially what that poll question is asking is uh, according to the BLS uh, patient care standards how deep are we allowed to insert the catheter to suction? So it'll take a second just for us to get the uh, poll open. Oh, and there we go, the poll should be open. So according to the BLS patient care standards, 
how deep can we insert the catheter to suction the patient. So A, as far as you want, uh, B, until the uh, entire catheter is no longer visible, uh, C, uh, only as far as you can see, or D, none of the above. So we'll give you a few seconds to, uh, to answer that. And remember, this is for the BLS PCS version, not the ALS PCS version. All right. So okay, so I think we'll. I think everybody might have had a chance to uh, cast their vote there. So what we'll do, we'll uh, we'll close up that poll and see how everybody has done. Okay, so. As far as you want, nobody picked that, so 0% there. Uh, B, until the catheter is no longer visible, 0%. Uh, C, 90% of you chose only as far as you can see. And D, 10% uh, of you said none of the above. So the correct answer is C. Uh, that's the basic rules of suctioning. Uh, when there's no landmarking available, uh, only suction as far as you can see. That is one of the big rules of suctioning that we, we still utilize, and that's what we will continue to do. If I may, I think that's actually really uh, good advice to anybody if they have a trach or not. Rationale is the best way to clear secretions out of someone is to have them cough. Um, and the, the best way to make them cough is to get them to take deep breaths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, anyway, that, that's largely it. So if you only suction what you can see, you're going to get the major portions out of it. allows them to have more space to move more air. Uh, sitting them up a little bit allows the diaphragm to drop drop a bit, allows them to cough stronger. Um, the basics will usually do you well. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So just uh, perfect, thank you, Mary. So going ahead with uh, ventilation and suction of a patient with a trach or stoma for the primary care paramedics, remember what we want to do is uh, assess their airway patency, breathing, and circulation. Always get that primary done. Uh, they have that need to be suctioned. So at this current time, as uh, Dr. Davis had spoke to a couple a couple of uh, minutes ago, we're only going to be suctioning and using the uh, criteria we have now. So we're suctioning uh, around the stoma to clear the secretions. We're not at the primary care level. We're not actually entering the stoma itself. And remember that uh, deep is uh, is an ALS procedure. And once you get down to the level of the cords, it's, it is considered deep suctioning. And uh, that is a that is a ALS uh, kind of guideline. Uh, Pete, if you have anything to, to oh, add. and that's where we had, we've identified that gap, and that's where we're working with ministry right now to progress this further, so that we can uh, you know not only ACPs but PCPs as well. We can have the proper training to suction the stoma, help our patients out a lot more, right? And we are hopefully hopefully, as Dr. Davis said earlier, it's going to come soon. Uh, probably looking at research is what we're hanging on to. So if everybody's patient. Yeah. That's what we're, we're anticipating now. Yeah. We're starting to uh, develop the, the material for research. So we're anticipating that it will, will hopefully come out by the fall. But things do change, but we're, we're optimistic. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, it is one of the things for ACPs that we're taught how to do all these procedures. And like you know, works where we have there's an expectation to to utilize, but it makes it difficult when there is actually no medical directive or oversight for uh, and very invasive skill such as this. But uh, like as as Dr. Davis said, uh, we're we're very hopeful and optimistic that things will uh, things will change in the future, and that will be great. So uh, we have one more poll question for you. Uh, the fourth and final one. So we'll just give it a second to, to get the poll open there. And we start talking about medications. Uh, what medication can be administered through a, trach, a tracheostomy or stoma? So is it A, midazolam, uh, B, Ventolin, C, nitroglycerin, or uh, D, ASA? So we'll give you uh, a couple uh, minutes to, uh, or a couple seconds to make your choice. So you can go ahead and vote accordingly. Okay, so we'll we'll close up the polls here and we'll see how or what everybody said and how everybody did there. So 
So 4% of you uh, said A, midazolam, 96% said B, ventolin, uh, and there were 0% for both C, nitroglycerin, and D, ASA. So the correct answer, uh, the medications to go through the trachea stoma, would be ventolin. Uh, yeah, that, that is the correct one, B. So uh, midazolam, it is not a respiratory drug for the ACPs out there. We know we do have, we can, we can utilize midazolam in a buccal form for a patient uh, in active, uh, like tonic clonic type seizure. Um, uh, nitroglycerin is a sublingual medication. It is not inhaled, so uh, it helps with vasodilation. Uh, and aspirin uh, is uh, by mouth, so it's chewed and swallowed. So the respiratory drug. The ventolin uh, to help with, uh, with bronchoconstriction uh, to help uh, dilate uh, dilate those airways. So moving on here, uh, as we get into suctioning and ventilation of a patient uh, with a tracheostoma, stoma, uh, this is kind of there is some literature out there, uh, but as Dr. Davis said, we are not going to be utilizing suctioning the tracheostoma at this time continue as you have been. Um, kind of the general consensus in that sort of treatment is it's a gentle, very, very gentle introduction until resistance is met. You're not inserting the entire catheter. Uh, intermittent suctioning while we're drawing the catheter and you're only going to have enough vacuum pressure or suction levels to remove the secretions uh, and may require more than one suctioning attempt. Um, but as, as Dr. Davis had said, we're, in, we're not there yet. Um, but it is, we're optimistic that this will be so, coming. Dwayne, just before you move on, um, especially with this slide here, um, you may want to lube your, lube your catheter before you insert it. And lubing is not with the, with the lube itself. Suction up some water, yeah. right, and get it to, yeah. to flow nicely, test it out prior to you inserting it into the patient. And then uh, just on the last point where it says we may require some more attempts, Make sure you ventilate the patient in between, right? I think Myron can attest to that as in years of RT uh, performance that sometimes it happens where we forget to do that. Yeah, I, I think the basics are if you can get them the cough, the greater the way, the greater they're going to clear the secretions. Suctioning somebody manually is one of the worst way to get secretions out of their out of their bodies, um, but sometimes we have to because our hands are forced. Uh, going down as far as you can just to clear the the amount that we need to get out, then that's what we do. And if we have to go deeper, well, then we go a little bit deeper. Um, fine when you insert the catheter and if you tickle the carina, uh, if you're going with a trach tube or a stoma, that will trigger a pretty strong cough. And that's fantastic when that happens. And that will clear a lot. So you don't have to go down deep. Just trigger the cough, let them cough the stuff up, suction them up for 10 seconds, uh, and that will be awesome. And uh, Depending on how they're doing, I may or may not ventilate them. Um, again, it's really based, you guys use that clinical judgment all the time, so you'll know when to ventilate and when not to. I find that if I ventilate some, sometimes when they're actually uh, breathing spontaneously, I can get them to buck and fight them more with it instead. So, but to provide oxygen in between, absolutely. In the, in, the, in the field, on scene calls, it's probably the only way you can do it is to give it with a bag valve mask. So if that's what you do, then that sounds pretty reasonable to me. I think Myron brings up a very important pearl here is the body's designed to do things best and sometimes what we do you know can assist it but you know like Myron says if they're, they're having secretion the best thing you can actually get your patient to do is cough themselves and as Myron said sometimes that's not the case they're unable to do it but the majority of these patients that may be having secretions just coach them into taking those deep breaths and coughing as forcefully as they can to clear those secretions. Nothing beats the body. That's excellent. Excellent. So, just moving on here. When we're uh, when we are suctioning and ventilation patients with a tracheostoma, um, you know, it, we need to be very very cautious, and we follow the parameters for oral suctioning, and and we don't want to be using high high suction pressures or vacuum pressures, because uh, you know the first thing it's going to do, remember, it not only removes all the secretions, but it pulls out a lot of oxygen as well. Inadvertently, we can cause uh, through negative pressure. Uh, Barotrauma, uh, which in turn, um, you know, by the high pressures can cause the alveoli to actually collapse in on themselves. Uh, worst case scenario, we inadvertently uh, give them a pneumothorax. And when we start getting into suctioning too deep, 
we, we mostly heard this around children in our training, but I mean people like everybody this can this can affect too. We get into vagal stimulation and then then suddenly we have this patient who has an airway uh, that has huge airway compromises of the tracheostoma and now we've inadvertently caused them to become bradycardic. Uh, and now we're dealing with a whole other animal at that point. So it's it's it very important to uh, just be cautious with the suction. I mean, we, we want to clear the airway and maintain the airway and do that efficiently, but by sometimes going too aggressive, um, it's we're doing more damage than good. Right, Dwayne, and we should be very careful with setting the vacuum pressures as well with all the different uh, suction devices we have out there. Um, I think there's not suggested pressure for suctions, 150. Brian, you confirm that? We use different numbers in the hospital, and you guys use pre-hospital, and uh, you're a little bit higher pre-hospital, but that makes sense in the in the situation that you're in. So if your protocol suggests max of 150, that's what you should do. The dangers of going with high suction values is you will actually cause some trauma to the trachea itself, uh, and you pull a layer of cilia off every time you you try to suction out the trachea. So the more the more vacuum you have, the more you'll pull it up. As Dwayne said, you're going to increase vagal stimulation. Uh, I've suctioned literally thousands and thousands of people. Uh, I can count on my one hand how many adults have gone bradycardic with it. Um, children and infants are a very different story. They go bratty a lot quicker, um, and it's pretty common with them. But for adults, it's it's not very common at all. Um, again, if we look at what some of the causes or side effects of suctioning somebody, that's hypoxemia. Uh, and if they're already hypoxic and we suction them out and we extend that, they may go bradycardic, not only from the vagal, vagal stimulation, but a profound hypoxemia that we give them. But the reality is you have to establish that area. You're going to do what you have to do and away you go. Don't get too anxious. There's going to be lots of, of training that comes with this, this directive when it comes out, talking about pressures and you know the procedure and the step-by-step -step kind of recipe of, of how to properly properly suction so that will come out uh, when this directive gets released as well okay perfect so moving on here so we'll talk a little bit about medications uh, that can be administered for patients with uh, these trachs, tracheostomies and stomas uh, for the for the primary care paramedics uh, ideally our first um, our first uh, medication and the one we often I uh, don't think of it as a medication is oxygen administration. Okay, uh, that's very important to get the patient well oxygenated uh, and moving forward with that. Uh, that's important. Sometimes that's all you need is to do is just a hypoxic issue. Um, as well as Ventolin, uh, the salbutamol can be administered for your, your patients who are short of breath, uh, evidence of bronchoconstriction, uh, the COPD patients, and those asthmatic patients that are uh, bronchoconstricted and having a hard time breathing. When we look at uh, uh, medications here for and different types of uh, devices, uh, so there are some EMS services that uh, do carry trach masks. If, you, if your service does utilize a trach mask and you have been trained in your service and it's approved for use uh, within your service, utilize and tr uh, utilize it according to the training you have received. Uh, trach masks aren't a very common thing that are carried. Um, out there, uh, I've seen very few, but uh, some services do elect to carry them. Um, with that, if you do not have, if you don't have the trach masks, so when you're starting to getting into uh, uh, administering uh, Ventolin, uh, Salbutamol to these patients, you may have to use the smaller pediatric size nebulizer because it, it would fit in to, into the neck area. Um, the other thing too, uh, with that is direct the medication flow uh, towards towards uh, the stoma itself. So the mist coming out of the nebulizer, uh, direct that towards the uh, the opening of the stoma itself to utilize a, to get as much med in as possible. Um, and Pete's just going to comment on uh, the right. There, there's a question I actually uh, just asked it of Meyer and any actually. So it was dealing with uh, possibly some croup in the upper airway uh, portion, and if we were ever presented with a patient with a trach or soma who presented with croup, could we nebulize the epi to continue and progress through that? And absolutely, you can. You can nebulize it and put it through, and it should help relieve the patient's uh, symptoms. So the one thing in croup, so that's a, that's going to be an upper wear, 
upper airway issue. So if the person has a, a trach, then it, it's unlikely to be uh, croup as the cause of, of any kind of the respiratory distress there. So remember that the trach is, is below the upper airway and croup is an issue with, with the upper airway in pediatric patients. So, uh, you know, if you're thinking croup and there's a, a, a tracheostomy tube or a stoma there, then, you know, kind of put that off your differential and think of, of potentially something, something else. Excellent. Okay, so looking at the meds for um, for ACPs out there that we can uh, utilize with the trach or stoma. So uh, essentially the same as the primary care paramedics. Uh, oxygen, of course, uh, Ventolin uh, for your shortness of breath, bronchoconstricted, COPD patients, your asthmatic patients. Uh, and then in an arrest situation, we can utilize the trach as a route to get the drugs down. It's similar if you cannot establish the intravenous, cannot establish the interosseous line, um, you can you can administer the epinephrine down the tube as well as the lidocaine. And just note, um, this is this is kind of a last ditch effort. If we can't get the line, the intravenous, if you cannot establish the IO, then you can dump it directly down the trach uh, stoma. Um, it's the same premise as a uh, as an endotracheal tube, and you would use the same dosing values as you would going down endotracheal tube. So, so that pretty much brings us to our conclusion of the webinar. I hope you've uh, enjoyed this, and it was uh, a bit of a review. So and there was a, a question that came in, and it uh, revolves around. Uh, the bradycardia associated with suction. The question was, how long would the bradycardia likely last? And you have to remember, the, the most likely cause of, the, of the, the bradycardia potentially, or not most likely, but potentially could just be a vagal response. And we've all had those patients who have become vagal on us, and yeah, sure, their heart rate drops down, their blood pressure drops down, but this is, you know, a relatively short period of time. Uh, more, you know, can you say this is how long it's going to last for everyone? No, but there's all different causes of the bradycardia. For instance, as Myron was saying, if the patient is already hypoxic um, and now you're suctioning, causing more hypoxia, it could be a bit of a downward spiral where that bradycardia is, is secondary to that. Um, so there's no you know, real time frame on it. If it's a true vagal response, that, that heart rate should pop back up after the suctioning. Cool. Okay, great. Great. Um, so um, that essentially concludes uh, the webinar on the uh, tracheostomy slash uh, stoma care. Um, as we've all said, and Dr. Davis has said many times, yeah, stay, stay tuned. Maybe in the fall we'll we'll have a uh, an actual directive. Yeah, keep doing keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you know, kind of think of this as a bit of a, a sneak peek into what's what's coming down the road. A little bit of. Uh, a heads up and a little bit of background information and like I say we're optimistic we're hoping that uh, at this year's research we'll be able to to teach around this directive if, if it is uh, released by the ministry by that time uh, but it is it is on their desk and should be should be coming forth in the near future and uh, John's just going to give a bit more information here Okay, well, uh, thank you very much uh, to our presenters and thank you all for attending today's webinar. Um, we have had a couple of questions that have come up and um, I'm just going to get these over to Dr. Davis and I'm gonna leave everything up for now. So if you wanna put your hand up and ask a question, now is the time to do it. Like I said, I will be leaving, um, leaving the webinar going a little bit longer just to make sure that that we get all the questions answered. Um, so just stay tuned for about another minute and then that will be it for us.
So sorry about that. We got a couple more questions that came in. So first question, any idea of when the protocol will be coming down the line? But um, as, as I've said, it's uh, approved by the Provincial Medical Advisory Committee. It's sitting at the, the minister's table now for uh, release. Um, there are some, some issues, or not issues, but some, some delays with, or this has to be released with the, the BLS, um, the upcoming BLS. They're going to go in hand in hand with the upcoming ALS PCS. So uh, once everything is organized from that standpoint, this will, this will come up. Do I know when that will be? No, I do not know when that will be. But as I said, we're anticipating, you know, training in the fall. So hopefully by then, but I can't say 100% sure. And the next question, can we give atropine uh, by a tracheal stoma for bradycardia if no IV IO is established and we get a patch order to use the stoma? So probably a very rare occurrence, um, but um, you know, using atropine via the, the, the stoma or consider it as the ETT route for, for bradycardia. I think you have, to, you have to ask yourself, you know, what is the cause of the patient's bradycardia? And um, you know, everyone's going to be a bit different. Now we all know atropine is, is good for those vagal responses uh, to, to uh, mediate that. Uh, you know, a lot of the times if it's going to be suction-related basal vagal or, or vagal tone increasing, causing the heart rate to drop, it should self-resolve. If the issue is hypoxia, you know, I want you to focus more on the issues causing the hypoxia rather than the heart rate itself. Atropine is not going to help if they're hypoxic um, and their heart rate sitting down in the 30s. The, the issue should probably be more focused on bringing that oxygen up as a first-line attempt. So, you know, there's going to be, you know, the one-offs, the one-ifs. Sure, there could be a, a time that it's indicated. If you're using your clinical judgment and you think it may be beneficial, then sure, that would be a, a reasonable time to patch to the base hospital physician for some shared decision making. But again, just kind of think, why? What is the cause of the bradycardia, and then try to tr troubleshoot that, and then fix that as a cause, as opposed to, I've got atropine here. I know when it's bradycardic, I can I can give this atropine. So kind of get away from that thinking and think of why the bradycardia is occurring. Excellent. Uh, any final thoughts, gentlemen? Uh, we missed one, one slide, I think, or we wanted to discuss one more thing as we, as we were breaking there. And it was about if you are troubleshooting a patient at the scene and uh, things are not going well and you're worried about this person's airway, does this person have an airway or not, they appear to have some device in their, in their neck, uh, but you hear something through their upper airway. As soon as you hear something through their upper airway, any noise or any uh, movement of air, it gives you a lot more options to deal with uh, clinically at, at the scene. So now you can uh, manage these patients like we normally would with bag valve masking and, and treating from above. And that's, to be honest, by far the majority of the cases, you're going to have the ability to work from above. And so if you hear those noises uh, and you see and you hear good air movement from, from above, if they have a, a trachea or, or even a stoma for that matter, um, those are good signs. It gives you that much, that many more options at the field, and bag valve masking and going back to what we're very comfortable with is the right thing to do. Now, I got a question for you, Myron, and it's just a one-off probably. If you have, say, the stoma and you're having a hard time ventilating through that stoma, you go back to the top. Now, do you have to cover that stoma to try to ventilate through, or do you? It'll become obvious to you when you start to ventilate them. So if they have air movement from above, and uh, you go, oh boy, I. I whatever reason I can't work it through the stoma itself, through the trach tube of the stoma. Um, if that mask doesn't fit or the trach mask, just a small seal mask, um, pediatric mask has fallen on the floor somewhere, is underneath the van, then yeah, you can try to go from above and away you go. And if you do and there is good air movement, it's going to leak all over the place. So yeah, you'll need to put a thumb over top of, a thumb or a finger over top of that hole, and then you bag valve mask. You'll need an extra pair of hands for one person to do that for you. Right. That's, a, that's a great question. It makes lots of sense. Perfect. Is that a common occurrence that it would be leaky around there as opposed to like the seal of the stoma? Yeah, if they don't have a cuff in, um, okay. or if they're not, um, and the cuff's not up, uh, or if they don't have a complete laryngectomy, so they remove the larynx itself, and then they sew the trach trachea right to the stoma, which is pretty rare that we'd see that. Okay. Um, but if one of those, if that doesn't happen, which is by far the majority of the trachs you're going to see, there should be some sort of communication between the two, and that's what always going to be easiest. And my advice would be to leave that device in, manage from above, 
uh, until you get more pairs of hands there. Excellent. Thanks. Great. Thanks everyone for joining us again today, and uh, and uh, we'll hand it back over to to John. Okay, thank you. And we have no more questions. So that is officially the end of our uh, webinar. And um, have a great weekend, everybody.